I'd like to tell you tonight about the uh, coming revolution in medicine uh, from uh, reactive to proactive. Reactive medicine is where you wait until you're sick before you go to a doctor and they try and fix you. Proactive medicine, as you'll see in the course of my lecture, is going to be uh, fundamentally different. What is also true about the medicine of the future is it is really revolutionary. The changes are not going to be incremental. They, in fact, are fueled by a completely different vision of medicine. Namely, medicine is going to be an informational science. And I predict in 10 years or so, every single one of us will have a virtual cloud of billions of data points. And from that, we'll be able to sculpt with exacting specificity our health as opposed to disease uh, potentiality. And of course, the really interesting question is, how exactly are we going to do that? And I'll begin to tell you about that tonight. The other thing that I would say is the medicine of the future is something I've called P4 medicine. It's predictive, personalized, preventive, and participatory. And we'll talk in some detail about what exactly that means. But what might be useful for uh, the general audience is to put this vision of medicine in a general context. When I started thinking about where I wanted to go in the mid-90s, it was obvious to me that the biggest challenge coming up in the next century was going to be the challenge of complexity. And I think that's a challenge for all scientific disciplines uh, and all engineering disciplines. Now, what is fascinating about biology is it has perhaps unique capacity for attacking its own complexity. And those capacities arise, one, because we now are viewing biology as an informational science. Two, we're beginning to take systems approaches to attacking problems of complexity, a holistic approach rather than an atomistic approach. Number three, there are striking emerging technologies that are going to open up completely new uh, dimensions of data space, and in our particular case, the data space of patients. And finally, we're going to be developing powerful new analytic and computational tools that can, can deal with all this information. Now, because biology and medicine has this, uh, these powerful series of uh, conjunctions that will let us let it attack complexity, we're uh, going to be, I think, in a unique position to attack some of society's most fundamental problems. Uh, healthcare, energy, uh, environment, uh, agriculture, uh, nutrition, global health, and so on. And of course, tonight, I'll talk about healthcare. And what I'd like to begin by doing is to reemphasize again this idea that the core of this new medicine are these four different prescriptions, these four different pillars. And we'll talk in turn about each of those. Biology is an informational science. The systems approaches uh, both to biology and medicine, emerging technologies, as well as the, uh, the analytic tools. So, so what exactly do we mean uh, by biology as an informational science? And I can give you just the barest hints of what I think is one of the most exciting revolutions in biology ever. When I started uh, uh, my uh, assistant professorship at Caltech in 1970, we had a sense of biological information then. And in fact, I was very interested in developing tools that would allow us to decipher these various types of information. But of course, the, the core of the information is embedded in this four-letter language in DNA. And it's read out as quantized units called genes into 
uh, a second type of four-lettered uh, nucleic acid language called RNA. And that, of course, is transcribed into a much more complicated Balmer called a protein with 20 different subunits. And of course, proteins have the ability to fold in complex three-dimensional uh, configurations, and they execute the functions of life. Uh, proteins are the machines, the engines of, uh, uh, of life, and we'll talk more about them in a few moments. And we even knew vaguely at that time that proteins got together and interacted with one another to form systems, and that, was, uh, that ev eventually led to the complexity in humans. But I think our level of understanding about biological information uh, is enormously more precise today, and we have the technologies to be able to assess information uh, at its many different levels. So fundamentally, biological information can be divided into two categories. There's the digital information that's encoded in your genome, and there are the environmental signals that come from outside the genome, and it's the collision of these two types of information that lead to the development of living organisms, their physiologic responses, and they lead to uh, the initiation and progression of disease. Now, a really interesting question we can ask is, what connects the collision of these two types of information with their output, their phenotype, what happens in the organism? And of course, the answer is there are two molecular structures that mediate information in interesting ways. One are the biological networks that capture and transmit and integrate uh, and finally pass off information to the second of these structures, uh, simple and complex molecular machines, which execute the functions of life. And in fact, the boundaries between networks and machines are not always so clear. But it's these dynamic structures that encode the fundamental uh, molecular principles of life. And they are the focus, very much the focus, of uh, systems approaches to understanding uh, biology on the one hand and medicine on the other hand. What is important to emphasize as we begin to talk about disease is that disease, again, arise, can arise as a consequence of these two fundamental types of information. You can have defects in the genes, or you can have environmental stimuli, such as infectious agents that cause disease. And for any disease, the really interesting question is what is the relative balance between the digital contribution of the genome and the environmental contribution? And in a sense, a really beautiful example of this uh, collision of these two types of information are fingerprints. So these are the left index fingerprints of two identical twin girls. And if you look at them, you see that the fingerprints are completely different from one another in spite of the fact their genes are identical. So this says unequivocally the fingerprint con contribution comes from environmental signals. And the really fascinating question is, do those environmental signals arise as a consequence of stochastic events in generating fingerprints, or they, do they arise as a result of subtle environmental signals? And we don't really know the answer to that. But this whole question in medicine and in disease of what the relative contributions are is really critical. Now, the final point I'd make about biological information is it is hierarchical in nature. We start with DNA and go to RNA and go to proteins and go to interactions and networks and finally to cells and organs and individuals and, and uh, populations and ecologies. And the really important thing to understand is that each of those levels of information, the environment impinges upon and modifies the fundamental digital signal. And that's true even at the level of DNA, a whole field called epigenetics has emerged as a consequence of environmental modifications of how genes manifest their information. The important point of uh, that uh, elucidation is that in order to really understand how systems work, we have to look at the level of the system we'd like to interrogate. Suppose it's the cell 
dividing, you have to capture the preceding levels of information and integrate them together in such a way that you can render explicit the environmental contributions at each of these levels because we have to understand both the digital and the environmental contributions. And that, in fact, is one of the grand challenges of systems biology. How we do this information integration has only uh, been partially solved uh, at this point in time. So let's talk a little bit now about systems approaches. And I'll talk about systems approaches by using really a simple analogy. And that is, suppose that you're an engineer and you'd like to figure out how a radio can actually convert radio waves into sound waves. How might you go about doing that? Well, one thing you might do is to take the radio apart and assess all of its individual components. And you might even try and identify what the individual components do. And that is exactly how biology functioned for much of the last 40 years or so. We looked at individual genes or at individual proteins, and we tried to assess just exactly what their functions were. And what the Genome Project gave us that was uniquely enabling of systems approaches was a complete parts list of all the genes and, by inference, all the proteins present in humans and other organisms. So in order to really understand how a radio works, what you have to do is put those components back together in their individual circuits and then come to understand how the circuits individually and collectively then convert information from radio to sound waves. And it's exactly the same kind of thing that happens in living organisms. The biological circuitry there takes this blend of digital and environmental information, integrates it, modulates it, and then it passes it off to the molecular machines that actually execute the function. So to understand development, to understand physiologic responses, or to understand disease, we have to understand the dynamics of networks and their corresponding molecular machines. Now, another fundamental aspect of systems biology, which is very different from biology of the past, is it must necessarily be very cross-disciplinary in nature. So at the institute, we have the Institute for Systems Biology. We have all of the types of scientists you see on the right-hand side of the screen. They're biologists and chemists and computer scientists and engineers and mathematicians and physicists and, and, and so forth. And the really key thing about these, this cross-disciplinary environment is, one, all of the scientists have to learn the language of the other scientists so we can communicate effectively. And this is very challenging. And number two, we have to learn to work together effectively in teams to attack big and hard problems. And I'll say more about big problems a little bit later. But the fundamental driving principle of systems biology is the idea that biology is the real driver. And it specifies and dictates the nature of technologies that should be developed. And they, in turn, dictate the nature of the computational and mathematical tools you need to analyze the data. So it's a very nicely driven circuit with biology being the leading directing vector in this entire process. So how do we think about disease? What exactly is disease in terms of this informational view of biology? Well, it's nothing more than the perturbation of one or more biological networks in the disease-relevant organ. And these disease-perturbed networks alter the envelope of information they can express, and they do so dynamically in ways that change across the progression of the disease. And if you understand the dynamics of this differential expression, it gives you fundamental insights into the mechanism of disease and new approaches to diagnosis, therapy, and even prevention. And I'll indicate a little bit about these uh, as, as we go on. But to give you a more concrete sense of what exactly a systems approach to disease is, let me talk about a disease we've studied in mice a neurodegenerative disease that's caused by uh, an infectious protein called prion proteins that uh, create a perturbation in the, 
the circuitry of the brain cells that lead to the pathophysiology of the disease. And this prion protein is fascinating in itself. Prion protein is distributed throughout the body. What can happen to this protein, which is unique among most proteins, is it can alter its three-dimensional configuration to become, quote, infectious. And as an infectious agent, it has two capacities. One, it has the capacity to catalytically convert normal prions to their disease form. So this disease is remarkably autocatalytic. It's an incredibly dangerous disease. And number two, that infectious prion protein is resistant to proteases, and probably that's what leads it to aggregate nerve cells and lead to their death and destruction, and that leads to the neurodegenerative phenomena. So what we were able to do is to study the brain cells and look at the kinds of information that were expressed in their brain, uh, in their brains, and we, we looked at the information at the level of RNA molecules. It's very easy to look at, and in fact, we subtracted the brains of normal animals from the brains of the diseased animals at multiple time points across the onset of the disease. And that gave us a very nice picture of how the fundamental pathophysiologic processes of this disease actually manifest themselves. So there are four major types of biological networks that I've listed here, prion accumulation and glial activation and two different forms of neural degeneration. And we can map each of these four into biological networks. And then we can impose on those biological networks the dynamics of how the messenger RNA changed in the diseased animals. And in doing so, we were able to get a snapshot for each of the four networks, and this is just one of the four, and how they changed across the in this case, 22 weeks of uh, disease existence. And you can see the panel on the left has no changes at six weeks, a few changes at 12 weeks, and striking changes at 22 weeks. So there was a dynamics to this whole process of what was happening in the brain cells. And what was equally interesting is that those four major networks that were disease perturbed became disease perturbed in a ordered fashion, first prion accumulation, then glial activation, and then the two forms of neurodegeneration. Why is this important? One, it's important because those changes explain virtually everything we knew about the uh, pathophysiology of this disease. They really explain beautifully the mechanism of the disease. And two, it gave us new insights into diagnostic and therapeutic approaches. And the essence was, if you wanted to do early diagnosis in this disease, look to the changes that occur in the very first network, because that will give you the earliest diagnosis. And two, with regard to therapy, if we could design drugs that made disease-perturbed networks behave in a normal fashion, you'd want to, again, focus those on the first network because that would then block the perturbation of any of the subsequent downstream networks. Now, the other thing that emerged from these studies was a new systems view of diagnosis. And the really key point here is we now have the tools to make blood a window into health and disease. And that's really important because blood bathes all the organs, it communicates with all the organs, and it's very, very easily accessible, especially with some of the new technologies that we're going to be talking about in just a few moments. And the, one of the fundamental ideas that we've uh, employed is the idea that every organ has proteins that are uniquely synthesized in that organ, and many of them are secreted into the blood. So there they constitute a fingerprint that is brain-specific or liver-specific or whatever organ-specific. And what we can say is if the brain is normal, the brain-specific proteins in the blood all each have their individual normal level set. If the brain becomes diseased with prions, say, 
a few of those networks change and their cognate protein levels will change in accordance with those changes. And the important thing we've also demonstrated is with other neurodegenerative diseases, completely different networks get perturbed. So in the blood, completely different fingerprints are demonstrated. So in this idea that we can make blood a window into health and disease, we have one, the capacity to distinguish health from disease, and two, if disease, we have the capacity to identify which of the types of disease. So this is going to be a very powerful approach to the future. And I'll talk a little bit later about the idea in the future. We hope to have 50 organ-specific proteins from each of the 50 major organs and to be able to monitor those two to three times a year so we can have a wellness measurement for each individual of the state of health of each of those 50 organs. Now, what is interesting is we've been able to demonstrate that this approach of organ-specific proteins is a powerful disease uh, diagnostic tool. We've demonstrated early disease detection. We've demonstrated the ability to divide diseases into their different types. Breast cancer, for example, isn't one disease. It's at least five different diseases. We can assess the uh, disease progression, and we'll be able to use these markers to follow therapy and, and to follow reoccurrence. So those are very, very powerful transformations of how we think about doing diagnosis. And remember, we don't need to go in and do an assay on the diseased organ anymore. We can, we can view the changes from the blood itself. What about emerging technologies? Well, here ISB is uh, working on many different things, but I'm only going to talk about uh, three of the uh, exemplary technologies that are really transformational. There is a whole new generation of DNA sequencing now that's absolutely transformed the speed with which this process can be carried out and the cost with which it can be carried out. And what we did recently was to sequence an entire family that had two different genetic diseases. And we were able, through that sequence analysis, to readily identify the two disease genes. And we were able to do that, basically, because the principles of Mendelian genetics allowed us, in this case, to make uh, error corrections at the level of 70% of the normal sequencing errors and it was this highly accurate sequence that allowed us to, to create the models and readily identify the disease genes. So we think sequencing families is going to be a very powerful tool for simple Mendelian genetic diseases, but we're also developing new techniques to use this to look at more complex diseases. Um, the second thing I'll talk about is together with Jim Heath at Caltech, we've worked for three or four years now, on developing little microfluidic chips that will allow us to measure vanishingly small quantities of proteins. And it's these protein chips that we want to be able to create uh, 50 proteins for each of 50 organs, 2,500 different measurements uh, from just a, a drop of blood. And how far have we come? We now have microfluidic chips which can make 50 protein measurements on uh, a fraction of a drop of blood in five minutes at a, a very high level of sensitivity, mid-level uh, atomal sensitivity. And the challenge for the future in expanding from 50 to 2,500 assays is we probably have to create a substitute for antibodies, a different kind of protein capture agent that is much more effective and much more rapid to develop. The third uh, area that I'd like to talk about is the use of iPS cells to do really fascinating things. So uh, uh, iPS cells are induced pluripotential cells. This is a technology that's emerged in just the last few years. And the idea is really a powerful one from the point of view of patients. We're collaborating with a company now called Cellular Dynamics that has the ability to take a few mils of blood from a patient and has the capacity to convert some of the nucleated white blood cells into iPS cells. So every patient now 
in principle, can have their own iPS cells. And of course, what is really nice about making iPS cells this way is they don't come from embryonic stem cells and you don't get into the ethical conundrums that have uh, challenged the stem cell field up until today. But the really important thing, there are two really important things we can do with uh, iPS cells. The first important thing is we can expand them indefinitely. So if we want from the patient a billion cells so we can study something, we can make a billion iPS cells. And again, this company we're collaborating with has developed the wherewithal now to differentiate cells into at least four major iPS cells into four major cell types, cardiomyocytes, neurons, endothelial cells, and liver cells. And in fact, what we're very excited about is this really intriguing idea that we can take then a patient's iPS cells and put in a test tube virtually any cells from any organ you want in that patient and we'll be able to study them, one, to understand the mechanisms of disease, two, to understand stratification of disease, and ultimately, of course, to use stem cells as, uh, as replacement therapy. And I think this is really going to be a transformational opportunity in biology today. So the final area, the transforming analytic tools, and I'm not going to get into any of the analytic tools at all, but rather I will illustrate a point I made at the very beginning of the lecture. In 10 years, we're going to be surrounded by billions of data points. And the really important thing is those billions of data points will be of many different types. And I would say the data points that come from uh, social media are going to be fundamentally important in fascinating ways, every bit as much as the molecular and cellular data points that, uh, that uh, come from the more conventional arenas of medicine. And the challenge of IT for healthcare in the future is how can we integratively translate this enormous amount of data, reduce its dimensionality, and come to, to conclusions about uh, the, the nature of health and disease for the, uh, for the individual. So it's these four things again, the transformational tools, the, the view of medicine as an informational science, systems approaches, emerging technologies, and the analytic tools that take us to what we call P4 medicine. And let's, let's talk a little bit about the four Ps. And I'll give you an example, say, uh, 10 years off or less, where I think we're going to be. I think in 10 years, every one of us will have our genome sequenced and it'll be a fundamental part of our record. And increasingly, we'll be able to look into that genome and make not only predictions about current health status, but uh, make predictions about future status as well. And that, of course, will require bringing in some environmental information. But what it will do is uniquely position us to be able to advise the individual on how to optimize their wellness, a really important opportunity for the future. I think in, in, uh, in uh, less than 10 years, we'll have a little handheld device that can prick your finger and take that droplet of blood and make those 2,500 uh, blood pro organ-specific protein measurements and thus will longitudinally be able to assess you, your health, and any transition from health to disease in any one of your uh, major organs and so forth. A real essence of what's coming from P4 medicine is that it is going to be uniquely personalized. You know, I never understood how in medical school the physicians could glibly say if we statistically average the results for certain metrics for patients and you get a bell curve if you're beyond some certain point on the edge of the curve you're sick and I never understood that because we're all enormously diverse genetically so how can you make bell curves of a genetically heterogeneous population and that's the essence of personalized medicine we are each genetically unique we differ on average by six million letters of the DNA language from one another. We respond uniquely to 
many different kinds of things. So it's really critical in medicine that each patient is their own control for an assessment of health against disease. And what is absolutely fascinating, of course, is not only the fact we'll have billions of data points to sculpt health and disease for the individual, but in time we'll have 340 million patients with uh, billions of data points that we can begin mining collectively to generate the predictive medicine of the future, a truly unique opportunity. And this is an effort we'd really like to see centered here in Seattle, and we're uh, endeavoring to make that a real possibility. What about the idea of prevention? And it really has uh, several different elements. Number one, uh, in the future, we'll design drugs, and it'll be multiple drugs, that will make disease-perturbed networks behave in a normal fashion. Number two, we can use systems approaches to understand for the first time how to induce cellular immune responses as well as uh, uh, antibody immune responses and thus to create the vaccines of the future. Again, something I've never understood is why uh, one of the NIH agencies poured billions of dollars into AIDS vaccines when the drug companies that were doing it essentially did it the same way Jenner did in 1796. And the results in this case have been uniform. Everything has failed. So it, the AIDS has been a black hole for money. Now for the first time, this institute has put out an RFA to take systems approaches to understanding uh, immunity and ultimately vaccines. And that obviously is a real way to do it. And I think these systems approaches will uh, transform our abilities to create vaccine. But I think the most important part of prevention is this idea of wellness. I think over the next 10 years or so, the entire focus of disease, uh, of healthcare is going to shift from disease to wellness. And more and more, we will be counseling uh, individuals on how to uh, create their own wellness. And of course, what is really critical about wellness is to have metrics that can assess your envelope of wellness and the vector of your slope toward or away from wellness so we can come to understand the behaviors that optimize your own unique wellness and so forth. Now the participatory really is the social aspect of the struggle P4 medicine is going to face. How do we get patients to understand the potential of PBOR medicine and its transformation? I think even more difficult, how do we get physicians to understand it and embrace it? Physicians tend to be among the most conservative uh, of all the types of, of, of professionals that, that I know. And I think it, we're going to, it's going to require really innovative approaches to teaching and communication to do that. How do we, uh, how do we educate the communities, the, the, the members of the medical community at large, the other members as well in this endeavor. So that's, that's one set of, of challenges with the participatory aspect of it. But the other is this gigantic problem of how are we going to deal with billions of data points? What is going to be the IT for health there that will give us the capacity to reduce that dimensionality. I don't see any of the companies out there, uh, the big ones, the IT companies, really looking at this problem in a serious way. They're looking at small aspects of this problem. And that, I think, is a real challenge for the future. So let me make two general comments about uh, societal implications of P4 medicine. It's going to transform in the next 10 years or so the business plan of virtually every aspect of the healthcare industry. And it's pharma, uh, uh, biotechnology companies, diagnostic companies. It's going to transform how medical uh, schools will have to, to teach uh, and to, to um, carry out research and to uh, treat patients. And of course, the big challenge, of course, is how do you impose, impose new ideas on old organizations? And in my experience, that is really, really difficult to do. Most organizations are remarkably uh, resistant to change. And the easiest way to do it is to create new organizations, but that won't be possible completely. But I would argue there will be many of the healthcare companies that exist today that will not exist in 10 years. 
And the converse of that is there are going to be enormous economic opportunities for institutions that are at the leading edge of this revolution to see where uh, the economic opportunities are going to be in the future. One of the really exciting ideas is that medicine is going to become digital. And this digitalization of medicine really has two aspects to it. One is the idea that we'll be able from a single molecule, a single cell, uh, a single organ, a single individual, any of the quantized units of information in biology will be able to extract disease-relevant information. A second aspect of digitalization is that we're going to use the devices we already have in hand to begin recording intensely our own personal information and that will again be this assessment of wellness and, and disease and so forth. So I would argue this digitalization of medicine will have impacts that will far exceed those uh, the digitalization of uh, information technology and communications. And in fact, one of the biggest transformations is I really see the digitalization together with other things I'll talk about in a moment, uh, turning around this ever escalating slope of the cost of healthcare in a really quite dramatic fashion and reducing it to the point that we can really export P4 medicine to the developing world. And in fact, it will become the framework, the foundation of global health uh, in the future. Now, why do I make that assertion? Uh, I make it for a lot of reasons. First, these new diagnostic techniques will allow us to stratify disease, to take a common type of disease like prostate cancer and to classify it into its major types. And the reason that's so important is then we can do an impedance match against appropriate drugs so we can get very high cure rates for the individual types of a particular disease. That is going to transform the cost of uh, health care in itself. Number two, um, I would argue that this ability to take drugs and re-engineer the behavior of disease-perturbed networks is a whole new paradigm for drug discovery that is going to enormously speed the process up and at the same time make it possible to have profitable drugs on uh, small numbers of uh, disease types, uh, individuals of types of disease that have low numbers of individuals. I would argue the idea of wellness is going to be absolutely transformational. And in a lot of ways, you can make economic arguments about how that is going to save enormous amounts of, uh, of, uh, of health care dollars and so forth. I would argue that the exponentially uh, changing technologies that we're seeing, DNA sequencing is one, but many others are going about as well, is really quite striking. And to give you this example I've given here, uh, we estimate maybe it costs uh, um, a, a billion dollars, or a, a million dollars, now that should be a billion dollars, in, uh, in 2000 to sequence the human genome. And today it costs about 6,500. So that's a 170, 200 fold difference. So you see the enormous changes that are occurring in these kinds of technologies and why we think it is really going to be possible to create these uh, billions of uh, data points. And of course, the, the final point is there are areas of medicine now that I think are really going to transform uh, our ability to deal with uh, disease. Stem cells, our capacity to understand, deal with neurodegeneration, with aging. I used to think aging was one of the most challenging problems. I think uh, it, it shows some real promise for manipulation in the future, vaccines, cancer, and, and, and the like. One of the really interesting ideas that, that uh, a colleague of mine, Mauricio Flores, really pushed was this idea that indeed we aren't just going to save money from healthcare, that, that, uh, that uh, P4 medicine is going to be a powerful driver of the economy in the 21st century. And one of the key ideas is this whole idea of how much we lose in terms of loss of productivity when people are uh, sick and how with wellness we can turn that whole process around. And this is, this is uh, hundreds of billions of dollars that we're talking about, quite obviously. And of course, P4 medicine is going to develop new opportunities. 
I think there will be a whole new industry of wellness that in magnitude will far come to exceed that for disease in the future. And of course, there will be a lot of new opportunities about disease-oriented companies as well that will come out of uh, P4 medicine. So, so really, what are the challenges for P4 medicine? There are two. One is the technical challenges. Um, how do we uh, create the strategies and the tools and the computational mathematical uh, wherewithal we need? The second, of course, are societal, the ethics, the legal, the social, security, policy, regulation, economics. And I would argue of the two, uh, the societal challenges are far the greater. And about five or six years ago, ISB started thinking about what do we need to do if we're going to make really a large impact in this emerging area of P4 medicine. And the conclusion we came to was we had to create strategic partnerships to take on this very big and challenging problem, namely P4 medicine. And I'll talk about two of the partnerships we've taken on. One is with the state of Luxembourg, and that on our side was to develop the tools and strategies for, uh, for patients. And for that, we were getting $100 million over the next five years, and I'll say more about that in just a moment. And the second was the idea that we had to create a new institution the P4 Medicine Institution to bring P4 Medicine to patients because that really wasn't the job of ISB. Our job is to create the new science. The P4 Medicine's job is to create then a network that I'll describe in just a moment of medical institutions that are going to pioneer this revolution in medicine. So what exactly is the Luxembourg Strategic Partnership what we agreed to do was create an institute like our own at uh, the University of Luxembourg, a center for systems biomedicine, and it's uh, very similar to what we've done with ISB, and we've hired an outstanding director, and that's gone very far indeed. And then we've agreed to help um, uh, Luxembourg really establish a biotech industry, which it didn't have, and we can talk about a lot of ways we've gone about doing that, but uh, we've put a major effort into that. And then, of course, we had uh, two major projects in P4 medicine that were working collaboratively with the Center for Systems Biomedicine in Luxembourg with uh, over the next uh, five years or so. The second strategic partnership, that of the P4 Medicine Institute, uh, was really an interesting one. So Ohio State Medical School and ISB are the founding members of this nonprofit 501c3 institute. And the, my, my view of what the P4 Medicine Institute should be doing is to identify and recruit and then integrate the information that comes from a small network of highly selected medical centers that really wish to bring P4 medicine to patients. And indeed, what we're doing with Ohio State now is our two pilot projects, one in wellness and the other in heart failure. And the importance of these pilot projects is the only way you convince people of paradigm changes is not by intellectual arguments, but by demonstrating explicitly the power of the new technology and the new science. And that's what we plan to do with these two demonstration projects. We're now, the P4 Medicine Institute is now seeking industrial and academic partners to extend this network. We'd like to find an industrial partner that shares our vision of what really is needed in IT for healthcare, for example. And of course, we want to bring in consultants to attract the many of societal problems of uh, P4 medicine. So really, what is the essence of uh, P4 medicine? It is this. It is simply two things. The essence on the one hand is quantifying wellness, and the essence on the other hand is the demystification of disease. And I'll guarantee you, over the next 10 years of your life, you'll see a marvelous transformation in both of these visions and objectives. Thank you very much. I encourage anyone with a question to go to one of the microphones. I'm Hunter Wessels from the Department of Urology here at UW, and a fascinating talk. My question is, how do you study the healthiest people that we have? For example, I have a cohort of 
men with diabetes, and I'm studying a urologic complication, but then there's a subset that has no disease at all that is at the other end of the spectrum. How do you approach that? Well, that's a great question. And, and the question really is, what are the metrics we can use for wellness? And since there aren't any right now, at least not any very good ones, let me tell you two or three that we plan to use. So number one, I think one of the most powerful metrics we're going to have is using these organ-specific blood proteins on a bi- or triannual basis. So we'll be able to follow multiple organs uh, and have a background for health so that we can see any transition into disease. So that's a fundamentally powerful tool. The limitation now is that we have three organs for which we have a fair number of organ-specific proteins, and we have 47 yet to go. It's just a matter of money. So uh, where we get the money to do this, of course, is an interesting challenge. A second area that I find absolutely fascinating is the studies that came from a, a biotech company I founded with Lee Hartwell and, and uh, Steve Friend uh, many years ago, Rosetta. What they found in studying uh, DNA, using DNA arrays to study many, many different types of disease was a signal of transcripts that seemed to be utterly independent of disease. It was of the order of 20 or so transcripts. And what they were able to demonstrate, at least in a provisional way, is those 20 transcripts were a metric for physiologic aging. So if you were 80 and you looked like you were 70, from that metric you got the answer of uh, 70. If you were 30 and you looked like you were 80, then you'd get the answer of 80. And what's wonderful about that metric is it is just the metric you want to measure. You don't care about physiologic, you don't care about chronologic age, you care about physiologic age. There is a third, uh, there are a third class of molecules in the blood that are absolutely fascinating, and these are a class of very little RNA molecules that are only about 20 bases long. These are called microRNAs, and they are enormously well protected in the blood, and it's utterly clear that they are wonderful metrics for distinguishing health from disease, so we plan to use those again as a third category of assay for looking at wellness. So the idea is with these kinds of metrics then and with longitudinal studies and normal individuals, we will be able to establish for each individual the metrics that define their own particular wellness and follow those. So that's, that's the approach that we'll beginning to be beginning to take with uh, Ohio State. Other questions? Hi, Dr. Hood. Uh, student in bioengineering uh, for getting my PhD and graduate student. It's just a real treat to hear you talk tonight. Um, my question is related to how you're rolling things out of ISB um, and how you actually want to change things in the future, um, change medicine and healthcare. Uh, you touched on it with Ohio State and the collaboration with Luxembourg. Um, specifically, I'm thinking of integrated diagnostics, which uh, works closely with you guys. Um, do you think this is a model that ISB is taking on into the future, or what can we expect coming out of ISB? Well, you, you've asked about two different things there. The company called Integrated Diagnostics is actually using these strategies for organ-specific um, blood diagnostics that I talked about. Uh, and we were remarkably successful in getting it funded uh, a year or so ago. And it's been remarkably successful in the first nine years of its, uh, nine months of its existence and everything. So one thing ISB is very good at doing is spinning out companies. We have spun out five companies since our existence. Uh, all are existent. Uh, we have, one of those companies was a company called The Accelerator, which is a partnership with five venture capital groups that makes new companies. That is, it funds very early stage technology companies and then pushes them, if successful, into the next stage of funding and so forth. So one thing ISB will continue to do is transfer the knowledge we gain to society through 
through companies that, that uh, enable the practice of this technology. Now, a second thing that we really hope to be able to do is to take our partnerships with medical schools to create a whole series of pilot projects that absolutely powerfully demonstrate the power of P4 medicine. Now, one of the challenges in the US is our system is, our healthcare system is enormously heterogeneous, both with regard to payers and providers and policy and all sorts of things. So one of the ideas that we're really intrigued with, and I just spent an hour with the Minister of Economy in Luxembourg uh, on December 4th, is the idea that if we're successful at Ohio State and several other institutions we're uh, trying to bring into this circle, that we'll take P4 medicine to the state of Luxembourg. And it's, it's absolutely ideal. It has the highest per capita income in the world. It has a ministry of nine individuals that really make the political kind of decisions. And we know, we know the key ones for healthcare and everything. In fact, the Minister of Healthcare from Luxembourg is visiting ISB tomorrow. And what we'd like to do is, and, and it's a single payer system, 500,000 uh, individuals in the country. So it would be a marvelous uh, pilot project country to demonstrate the power. And of course, that moves the dimension of demonstration orders of magnitude more powerfully when you're not talking about a single healthcare system, but you're talking about the healthcare system of a country. So those are some of the things that we'd like to do. We, I think this whole idea of strategic partnerships to attack big problems, though, is really important. And I will say another direction that we're thinking of moving, and we had a workshop with people from all over the world yesterday to talk about this, is systems biology in the environment. There are absolutely incredible things we can do with these new technologies, and we'd like to push them into this new area where there are enormous opportunities to uh, think about doing things that relate to uh, climate change and all the other kinds of things that, uh, that you've heard about. So, so I think ISB is really going to be pushing the idea of strategic partnerships and, and attacking with those really big problems. Other questions? Hi, um, my name's uh, Matt Spark, and I'm a professor of international studies and geography here at UW, and also an adjunct professor in global health. Um, and one of the things you, you uh, argued tonight was that P4 Medicine offered a new uh, platform, a foundation for global health because of it, its possible um, cheapness and uh, comprehensiveness. And I wanted to ask in that regard, a question about one of the um, sort of persistent concerns of, of global health policymakers and um, activists, ranging from AIDS activists in Africa to um, the World Health Organization to the Gates Foundation, which is that um, there, there are huge inequalities in, in where um, market-based science puts its energies in developing new therapies, um, like with with AIDS, uh, uh, va the vaccine for HIV, there's been much more work done on the, on the clades that affect North Americans versus Sub-Saharan Africans, despite the much larger numbers in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, because there's more effective demand from Americans and, and Canadians for, for, for therapies. And so I'm wondering, uh, you know, this isn't a critical question, it, it's, it's a really academic one, um, whether the systems approach that you're you see as part of P4 medicine uh, will alleviate those kinds of inequalities or, or possibly exacerbate them. Uh, I, I could see it going from what you said tonight in, in either direction, but I'd be interested to know, um, in part because you emphasize uh, working with industry so much, um, whether you see a danger there that the focus on individuals and the sort of molecularization and personalization will lead to a focus on therapies that, that basically are designed for the people that can pay and not for other people? You know, I think that's really a great question. Uh, my answer to that is 
If we do P4 medicine in the context of US, I think you're really correct. So what has to be done, and what I've argued for, is we ought to set up a center in South Africa that is um, similar to what I'm talking about here with ISB and its hubs and things like that, because the endogenous uh, uh, institute then would be uniquely place to take on the problems that are indigenous to its own locale. Now, a really critical part of that supposition is that at least initially the support for doing science in this institute would have to come, I would guess, from outside of Africa. So I've chatted a little bit with Bill Gates about would this be a possible thing that the the, um, the Gates Foundation could think about. And the, the Gates Foundation has been incredibly hard-nosed about what have you got for me today? And P4 medicine is coming very quickly, but uh, we, we have modest offerings today. So maybe that isn't going to happen until we're a little farther along, but it very easily could be an incredibly powerful tool for both bringing the right kind of intellect to Africa for the new medicine and serving as a beacon for attracting and, and attacking uh, endogenous problems of one sort or another. So I, th I think the problems aren't merely scientific, they're, they're strategic, political, localization kind of problems and we have to strategize about how we might go about setting in place such, a, such an opportunity. But I'll guarantee that if we put it in some place like Africa, it will, and, and it has the resources to attack these problems, it will attack African problems. I would like to thank everyone, and especially Lee, for an absolutely fantastic talk. Thank you so thank much. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and that, that, yeah.